This week's episode is sponsored by HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supply company in Scotland, where you can buy your whole kitchen online with all the prices on show, no gimmicks, just straightforward good deals for high quality kitchens and appliances. You can buy your kitchen from the comfort of your own home instead of getting pestered by pushy salespeople. Check out HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supplier in Scotland. They're in the pub, they're just having a good time. One bunk bumps into you, someone sees him bump into you. You look at them, they look at you and think, we found a cunt. And I just, I stabbed through him at the arse. No big, no big wounds or nothing dramatic. I stabbed through him at the arse. Is that when you feel alive? At yeah. Violence and angry and just up to mischief? Is that yeah. when you feel yeah. good? Yeah. It's a scary fucking place to be, in it, Paul? Every yeah. morning I wake up with it and I go to bed with it and I talk to myself day in and day out. Nothing's happened in the last seven years apart from that. Were you willing to take the blame and actually do the sentence and say it was your gun? A million miles an hour. So I went and bought a big thing of pig's blood from an abattoir. I said to his son, come with me. He don't really know what's gonna go on. I said, you just do whatever I tell you and I'll get there. So we go to the scrubs, six o'clock in the morning, just sitting there waiting got some people to film it and live stream it to the, the BBC and all that and it was just yeah, it felt right so I thought what is it with these people with this fucking word keep calling me a grass yeah and I looked round me and I, there's two geezers with machine guns and I went and my wife went Paul they've been here because I'm wanting to know what they're doing at the end of my bed and I can barely talk they had to put a thing over the top to talk and I remember looking at them and thinking, what the fuck? There's sometimes I want to walk out my door or get out of my car somewhere and get one in the head to give me some peace. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got London's Paul Tierlin. First Hello, of all, Paul, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. No problem. You are very well connected with one of the biggest crime families in the UK, the Adamses. You were shot by one of your best friends. Apparently, they were, allegedly, we're calling you a grass. This is one of the reasons why you're here today. You want to clear up a few things. But I always want to go back to the start, my guest, Paul, kind of where you grew up and how it all began. But first of all, how are you? Um, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Struggling mentally with it still because it's, it, as I've said, it's like, it broke me heart to be called a grass. Not being shot. That's an occupational hazard, I've said it before. But the mental side of things has been hard. Yeah. Really hard. Was that seven years ago? Seven, yeah, nearly eight years ago. Yeah, and it's still playing in your mind. 24-7. Yeah. Every morning I wake up with it and I go to bed with it and I talk to myself day in and day out. Nothing's happened in the last seven years apart from that. That's why it's so relevant in my mind. Yeah because it happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. Repeating it over and over. Over and over and yeah. over again. Yeah. So where did you grow up, Paul? In Islington. Yeah. I was. I grew up in the flats that overlooked Pentonville Prison. I had a white, uh, lived with my mum, dad, two sisters. Um, strange upbringing. Plenty of police involved, plenty of violence. Not on us, but it was a, it was a, um, it was a madass. Madass. From such a young age, a lot of violence? Yeah, from from five or six. Started early, early, early days. My life used to be, this is the good side of it. I'd sit on the windowsill with my legs out the window with a window pulled down. I'd look at everyone walking around the yard in the prison because it was that close to the yard. You could look into the prison yard. And I was fascinated, fascinated by prisoners and what's all them yellow stripes on their suits and... And in night times, I'd go to bed. And in them days, the lights used to go out, I think, at nine o'clock in the prison. So I'd look out my window and watch each light go out, each 
all as the screw was turning the lights off, and as each light went out, you heard you wanker, you slags calling to the screws. Terrified me. Yeah. And I used to get off on the fear. It absolutely terrified me, but I also wanted to go in there. Desperate to find out what went on behind them walls. Fascinating. That it's powerful with the power of the brain. That in your mind you wanted to be in there, and but I was scared. Lo and behold, you ended up in there. And I ended up. It took me till 1994 to get in the ville. And when I knew I was going there from the uh, Chelmsford, it was like now I can see what it looks like from the other side. And I was excited. You can't tell anyone you're excited, but I was really excited. The fact that I'm now going to see what that little boy was looking at. If does that make sense? Yeah. How yeah. old were you? When that, I was about four, when I used to sit there watching it, and I was when it was ninety four. So that was what twenty five years ago. And when did you get took inside? First time. Yeah. Um, Eighty three. What was it like though when if you were excited to be actually in a prison to be in a prison did it change your mindset or were you thinking no because I'd already I'd, I'd done bird before that Boston no I'd done a um, no I'd never done a Boston I'd done a remand in a, a what young offenders place done a bit of bird in Wandsworth which was for fuck me that was only two years I was in there and then got moved to Albany and other places but that's when prison was prison. Screws were screws. Kicking fuck out, you, slopping yeah. out. What you understand. Yeah. If you performed, you got flung down the stairs to the block. Mm -hmm. You understood that. No tellies, no phones. You had two books to read in your cell. You could have two letters in, two letters out. That was you. Yeah. Some jails are locked, so some people have got showers in their cell now. I understand that, but mm -hmm. you know what it is? That's all to make the screws job easier. They ain't, they're not doing it for you. They're doing it for them to save money. Yeah, and that's what it is. Now they're putting phones in the cell. Now they ain't got to let you out. Use the phone. Mm -hmm. It's it, yeah. it's nonsense. Yeah, your teenage years, Paul. How was that then? Were you boisterous, causing trouble? I'll be honest. My dad, I weren't that. I weren't that bad. I was. I was a bit of a timid kid, really. I didn't. Um, I, as I say, I had fear in me from a very, very young age. Didn't know what it was. But I was riddled with it. And um, it, it actually started, I was about seven, and the kids, we was all playing football. And this is a major part of my life. We was playing football, I got called in for my Sunday dinner. So, as a seven-year-old kid, I'm going in for my dinner, gives me a ball. Nah, we're carrying on playing, but they're all bigger kids, so I'll go up, crying. They've nicked my ball. So he comes in with Dad. What's the matter with him? Because if you cried in my house, you was a little puff. Right, yeah, you little cry baby. He came and he went, What's the crime on? I said, I've nicked my bowl. Eat your dinner. So I eat me dinner, bafters. Now, the ball situation's gone in it. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. I'm going out to play football. And where are you going? I went out. He went, All right, one minute. Come in. Put an hammer on the table. I ain't got a clue what the hammer's for. So he went, Coming in. So I went, Come on, what? I'm thinking, my dad don't even like football. <laughs> Get the hammer, go down the stairs, and I'm still oblivious to what I'm meant to do with this hammer. And he went, who took the, who took your ball? I said, Tony. It was a guy named Tony Knapp, who I ended up quite good friends with him. And he went, walk up behind him, hit him straight across the head with the hammer. Now... You've got to put that into into a kid's yeah. head. What age? But I think I was seven, but I may have been a bit younger than that. Shit. And it was, the f it was like hitting with an hammer. And I walked up behind him and I was, please run away. I was absolutely, I was petrified. Mm. And as I got towards him, I know I've got to do it, because if I don't, my old man's going to go up his head. Hit you with the hammer? Maybe not, but he would have <laughs> had a go, mate. So I walk up behind this and this young kid shouted out, Tony's got an hammer. And this Tony in that run, he was about three, four years old, maybe four or five years older than me. And he ran. And then there's all commotion in the flats. My dad said to me, why didn't you hit him with the hammer? I can remember this sentence, Eric, exactly Eric went, I went, I didn't want to hurt him. He went, you fucking puff, you've got to start hurting people. Hurt them, I'll hurt you. So that was the mindset that was put in my head. 
Was your dad a gangster? No, nah, he was a thief. He was a thief. He was a worker. Always supplied. Always never went without nothing. Food wise, good provider. But he didn't have a, a mum and dad to really look after him, and he was brought up on his own. So he yeah. didn't know these. Yeah, he, he ain't got them skills. Yeah, he's only teaching you from what he knows. What he knows. Yeah. So that was ingrained in you just to be ruthless then for such hurt a young people. age. It's the yeah. only way you get in, like, get on in life is mm-hmm. hurt people, and he just. And I, it was an odd. It didn't make sense because my dad would go to work, and then my mum would get you all dressed up in your best clothes, and someone would come around and do photographs you, with me two sisters all sitting there all dressed up. And it was like, hang on, she wants me to be a prince. Yeah. He wants me to be a, a bully or a fag or a yeah. violent man. So I never ever felt where I belonged. My whole life has been that way. And as I say, as soon as I got a chance to get out of my mum and dad's house, any time, go to my aunt's in um, Rumford, Rumford, Boroughwood, I'd escape to there because it was my safe place. And it was, I just didn't want to be at home. I'd live at my nan's, my uncle's. I was closer to my uncle than my own dad. And he knew that. Was it fear you had for your dad? It was, yeah. Better yeah, resentment, but yeah, because it, you weren't getting yeah, the, yeah, the loving, get it, the, cud, get the cuddles, yeah, 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 didn't that tension. Yeah. Yeah. And most kids didn't get that. Yeah. But with me, it was, um, because my sisters come along, it was like they was getting it all. Well, that's how it works. But I just couldn't seem to grasp that. And as I say, because I didn't hit a geezer with an hammer, I'm a puff. If I cry, I'm a little crybaby. He just knocked the life out of me without laying an hand on me. And never, ever give me a G. Mental abuse. Without even knowing it. Without even knowing it. And I'll, and I'll jump forward now. I come in one day, and I just had a little bit of a, a, a thing. Someone had got, had got shot. And I come in, and I blood all over me, and I was, my hand was bleeding, and my wife was in the middle of so stitching my hand up. And uh, he happened to turn up at the door. And he opened the door, he came in, he went, what's going on? So I went, oh, I've just, whatever, done so-and-so. He went, what's the fucking matter with you? Can't you grow up? And I looked at him and I thought, but this is what you wanted. Yeah. So this is what you want. Now I'm doing it, that ain't good enough. And it just sort of put a line under it as much as say, whatever I do is never going to be good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he that's created, how you feel. He created the violent kid, but yeah, when you, you got there... He wasn't happy, but that was just his demons. Doesn't matter if you'd won the lottery or been a football player, mad. he would have still found flaws. And, and that's all he put me down. Yeah, and put you down. And that that affects you even to this day. Yeah. Because we spoke coming up in the lift there and the, like the PAT, it's PSD, the, the mental health, that going through your whole life that you're not good enough. So your whole life you would have felt as if you had something to prove all the all fucking time. the time. Yeah. All the time. So your teenage years, how violent were you then? Not really. We used to, we used to go out. We, there was I used to mainly be with my pals who I grew up from school, but I was always that odd one out. Always had to go that little bit, little bit further. And even then, I, I didn't feel they was listen. They was the best friends I've ever had. My schoolmates, like who I grew up with in the flats. They was they was me friends. They didn't need nothing. They didn't want nothing. There was no angle. There was no hidden agenda. We were just pals. But even that always felt odd. And I've spoke to a few of them since, and they went, because well, my dad died about two, three months ago now. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, he it died of that COVID thing. So, You're joking? Yeah, yeah. Within six days. And um, It's still your dad at the end of the it's day? It's still my dad. And I, and I didn't have a, a good um, relationship with my dad. There was always a barrier there. There was always this, this odd... It was something that we never discussed. Yeah. And I just could never... And we had a, a bit of a rift going on over other things and about... Do you ever regret not having that conversation? Yeah. Yeah, I did have it to him. Nearer the end, I started to sort of soften myself because a few friends said to me, Paul, you got to... Because you'll talk to yourself if something happened to him. Yeah. And I did make amends and I did say to him, and it weren't him, it was, it was me. Mm-hmm. I was the one who took it all the wrong way. You can't... You can blame him, but... I'm a man, I should have been able to get... I'm nearly 60. I'm still living with these feelings of an insecure kid. Mm-hmm. That's 
that's really messed up. Yeah, that shit eats how we eat your soul, man. It's eating me alive. And then, it, yeah, it was so, the, the, as a child, it weren't that violent growing up in the years. And then I met Wayne. I was working on the Evening Standard. Complete, just fun, delivering papers, good fun. That was when I was about 17. Met up with Wayne. He's what, Wayne, Wayne Hurran. So he was the man they called, was it John Wayne? Because he always that's carried they, two that's guns. That's they called him, yeah. Because they carried two guns. They shot, he shot three coppers. Shot three coppers, yeah. Is it over 150 years as well he got? He was a man who had no fear. And at what age did you meet him? I was about 17. He would have been about 18. Shit. And um, that's when I first started carrying a knife. I went out with Wayne. We went out for a drink, went to the Sundown in Tottenham Court Road. And it was like, I see it come out and I thought, oh, I didn't mind fighting, but I weren't the best fighter. I'll, I'll say it now, I can't fight, but I will never fucking run from no one. And I thought, well, that looks easier. So then I started taking a knife out. And it become the norm, going out, having a drink. Women didn't come into it. We weren't interested in women. If they did, they did. But a fight was more important because mm -hmm. that was my only way of getting recognition. Yeah. And that's, that is how it was. So how was he then in his teenage years? Because he had the reputation of public enemy number one. Wayne was a f fearsome, fearsome person. He could have a fight. I've seen him fight Dorman and knock, when he was like 17, 18, knock three, four Dorman out. Mm -hmm. And just a fearless, fearless man. Yeah. And we had, a, we had a, 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 a close relationship. And really, when I look at Wayne now, God rest his soul, he was, he's a big part of my life. Because if I look at it, it was only meeting up with Wayne, I started getting involved in serious sort of crime, carrying weapons. I met my wife, because he was his wife's sister, my kids. Every, he had a major part in my life, mm. almost as much as what Pat did. But his part in my life was good. Good memories? Yeah. Family, basically. Yeah, he was. He yeah. was. Um, yeah, he was. He was. Uh, and he said it to me just before, just before he died. He, I was on a visit, and he went, "You know your biggest problem." I went, "What's that?" He went, "You always thought you had to prove something." Yeah. I didn't know he knew. I didn't have a clue anyone was on it. Seen right through it. Everyone see through it. Yeah. Everyone said yeah. me. It's scary that, isn't it, that why we always think we're, we're normal or we, we protect ourselves with bullshit. It's like we put ourselves around in this own wee bubble. But people do, once you actually start making changes to better your life, people say, I'm glad you done that. You go, why? Because this, this and this. And you go, did you know? Exactly yeah, right. And, and, yeah, and, and you thought you did yeah, well. Yeah, you thought you were invincible. And but, that's, that's the crazy side of it all. Yeah. Because I know you'd received a letter from um, Wayne before, because he had mental health issues. Wayne, when, he, when Wayne got to, um, when he was nicked, he went to Brixton. And the truth is, he got in Brixton and they smashed the life out of him. They had to, in them days, that's how it worked. Hmm. He got in there, he got a bit leery, they smashed the life out of him. And he never seemed to come back from that. He was like, schizophrenia kicked in. And he just, that was just, that was terrible to watch. That was terrible to watch. But that man had to deal with that for the next 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And it was, and it was, and I actually feel so guilty that I didn't give him more of my time. Yeah, you can't blame yourself. Bro. You can, because you you could have, it was, but if I'm honest, it was, he was unpredictable. Mm -hmm. He was so unpredictable. I've gone around his house, knocked on the door, and he's gone, Paul, fuck off. I went, what's not? He went, please go. Because I know if I don't, he knows he's going to do me with something. He can't stop it. And that's what he'd have done. And I just went, oh, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, he knew he was a danger to himself and other he people around it. him. He knew it. Because it admitted three, four murders. And is that when he got put into the psychiatric ward? No, he was already in the psychiatric ward. was he? When, he? when he's confessed to them. Mm -hmm. So they've gone and interviewed him while he's mentally unwell and listened to everything he said and believed it. And it's... Was it the truth? No. Nah, or was it just me. medication? It was... It was <clears throat> Boasting and just nutty talk, yeah. absolute nutty talk. You, if you've if you've ordered these things, 
on a phone in a prison, then there's evidence that it's happened, right? It weren't how it was said. It was absolute, probably fucking blown out of proportion. Yeah. How can they accept that, though, if you're medication? And, well, they didn't. And, uh, do you know what I mean? That's why the judge flung it out. The yeah. judge said to the jury, this man, these evidence, these statements are inadmissible. Because mm-hmm. they could be drugging someone up and asking them questions then without even their consent. Listen, I'll give you another for example, right? My cousin was, you heard about the, the jigsaw killer? Yeah. Right, that's my first cousin. That's whose house I used to go to to escape my mum's. Right. Stephen was on trial for that, right? I know the ins and outs of it. And I'll say it now because he rang me up the morning. I went and met him. And he basically told me the truth. He said, she stabbed the geezer in the back, right? I said, where is he? He said, he's in, in the shower. Gone. And he just didn't know what to do with him. He just, he was, so that's all it was, a girl stabbing someone. But what I'm trying to get, this is the bit I'm trying to get to. When he goes to trial, the prosecutor, uh, his barrister said to him, listen, they're talking about giving you a whole life sentence. Now, Stephen at the time was being medicated from Woodhill Prison and was like a, like a gone, just zombied. So they asked him a straight question. You need to give the judge something to stop him giving you an old life sentence. So he said, just sitting there like that, he said, in the court trial, they said he'd done this before, right? So they said, have you done it before? And he went like that. Just put four fingers up. That's it. He goes in the court and says, he has cut up four other bodies and uh, complete nonsense, but you shouldn't have allowed that to be used in that trial. And the other, the other thing to do with that, that case the girl who gave evidence against him, who was the main witness, I should have bought her a statement, I forgot it. She said she met the family, right? The Adamses, right? She met them at Stephen's nan's funeral. She was introduced to Tony and Terry. Now, they know there's not a Tony, right? The police. But they still allowed that evidence to go in, print in the papers, and made a big for raw that he'd been doing what he'd been doing for them. It's absolute nonsense. There is not a Tony and there's a Terry, but my uncle is Tony and Terry. They were Stephen's uncles, not them. But they allowed that in as, as evidence. And it just crucified him with him going like that. And he pr- said it was a mass murderer? If they all said he was, he was getting rid of bodies, yeah. It's, listen. Just because he lifted his hands Lifted up. four fingers up because he was told, and that's the truth, and, and, and let's get it right. She said he used to do it with me. We, we, we was the ones who used to do that. The jigsaw killers? Yeah. That's nuts. Fuck's sake, Paul, no wonder your head's fried. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but it's just... <laughs> hell. Do you know what I mean? But you imagine, I've got all that going on in my head. Yeah. And I've now got to go to people and go, listen, I'm going to mark your card about something. This has been said in court. And it's like, what the fuck's they got to do with us? Mm-hmm. And it just... Your old head starts. Yeah, plus it spirals as well yeah. off the papers, the news, everything. They just didn't stop. Yeah, you, because you had you glued yourself to the fence as well with um, with little Pop. Wayne's son. What, what happened? was that for? What happened? I had someone in the prison. They rang me up on a Saturday morning and said, "Paul, Wayne's killed himself." I said, "What do you mean he's killed himself?" But we've heard Wayne's died three or four times in the past. It's never been true, obviously. And they said, Wayne's like, took his own life. So, okay, we find out, we do a bit of backtracking. The girlfriend phones the prison, the prison gets in touch with them, so blah, blah, blah. So this, it's an ongoing thing. I'll get the next phone call is to tell me, blatantly, Paul, Wayne asked to see a listener. You know what a listener is, yeah? Yeah. Wayne's asked to see the listener. The listener was took out of his cell, gone around to three or four other cells, just before bang up, the screw said to the listener, this is, this is in, this is fact, said to the listener, we won't worry about Aaron, he's barricaded up anyway, which he was. Well, you shouldn't be going home if he's barricading up and leaving him. And secondly, he's asked to see a listener. You should have taken the listener to him. And they didn't. Next morning they're coming, Wayne's dead. So when I heard that, in my mind, they murdered him. 
they've allowed him, or he's murdered himself, but this ain't, this ain't fair. This ain't right, he was a sick man, he was an ill man, he should have been treated in an hospital, tried to get him to move to an hospital. So what I've done, I thought, I can't, I can't deal with this. Don't forget, I haven't done anything for seven years. I've just had my head wrapped up in my own little world. So I went and bought a big thing of pig's blood from an abattoir. Said to his son, come with me. He don't really know what's going to go on. I said, you just do whatever I tell you and I'll get there. So we go to the scrubs, six o'clock in the morning, just sitting there waiting. Got some people to film it and live stream it to the, the BBC and all that. And it was just, it, it felt right. It just, it's, it wasn't a lot else I can do. My hope was the screws was all going to come out and then I could have had a fight with all the screws and really caused a scene and hurt one or two of them because that's how I felt. And it was just, it worked perfect. And it was just, right, I went, right, Paul, run to that gate. There's the gorilla glue. Glue yourself to the gate. Make sure you get in a position so they can't open the gate either way. We shut the prison down. And I watched him and he, he just, you didn't even see him. He just sort of walked through the thing and just done it. And then I just done what I'd done with the blood. And then I had time to put myself on the gate. But it was, yeah, we was on there most of the day and it just mm -hmm. felt... It just felt good. I yeah. felt alive. Like a protest. Did you feel like your old self? Yeah, I felt... I've, I felt, Even though it's a protest causing mischief and just... It made me feel yeah. good. It made me think, this is what I've missed. This, this, this little... It weren't nothing serious, but it was an adrenaline rush. And also, it, it gave me strength. I felt the strength come through that prison from him. That's how I felt. Yeah. It was like his spirit was let out of that place. And it, it was just... Yeah, it was good. Is that when you feel alive? At yeah. Violence and angry and just up to mischief? Is that yeah. when you feel yeah. good? Yeah. It's a scary fucking place to be, isn't it, Paul? It's, it's, it is. It ain't a nice place, yeah. but it's a normal place. It's all you know. It's in your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. When I'm sitting indoors doing nothing, because I, I don't really saw seeing a handful of people, I don't want these people in my life no more. They're not, they're not proper friends. They talk about loyalty and all this shit. They're only as loyal as they gotta be. With me, I, I'm I'm loyal way beyond I should ever be with anyone. I'm like with all my friends. If you're my friend, yeah. I'll die for you. All I can ever offer a friend is and I've always said it to people, my loyalty, my liberty and my life. There's nothing else I can give you. Yeah. If that ain't enough, then your best job on. Cause what else can you want? Is that why you've been so broken over the last seven years? Because you're loyal to everyone, what you yeah. are capable of doing for others, willing to die, yeah. willing to go to prison God for life. Prison. So how did it come about then that you and Patrick became friends, who was Terry's brother, <coughs> one of the biggest crime families in the UK? So how did you and Patrick become friends? I met friends? him in Wandsworth. I'll be straight. I was in Wandsworth. I was in, on E-Wing, and I was shouting out the window to someone in the block. I was arguing, and I heard a voice go, is that Paul Tiernan? And I went, yeah, who's that? He means Pat Adams. And you know the first thought coming to my head? Fucking hell, he knows who I am. What the fuck's that about? I was, I was privileged. I know what? Yeah, he, he knows who I am. How can he know who I am? I went, yeah, anyway, long story short, he got there two days before. Screw came in to drag him out of bed and he attacked the screw and he got put in the block. And the first involvement with him was a geezer was slagging him off or slagging his family off out the windows, a black geezer. And he went, Paul, do us a favour. I went, of course. And I nearly come unstuck with the geezer because he was a right lump and it took two of us to have him over at the end of it. But that's how I got to, got to know Pat. And that's how your relationship grew? Mm. How long was that for? How long were you friends for? 30. Well, that was in 84, so I worked that out. 30 odd years. 35 years? Yeah, which is a long time. 35 years. Yeah. What was that sentence for? You were in prison for? That was for stabbings. I was nicked for three stabbings in, um, in a pub in Islington, which was, yeah, again, they're in the pub, they're just having a good time. One bunk bumps into you, someone sees him bump into you. You look at them, they look at you and you think, well, you think I can't. And I just, I stabbed through him at the arse. No big, no big wounds or nothing dramatic. I stood for him out the arse and I got nicked about, fuck me, a month later, 
going into Enfield Police Station to sign them for a bail case. And they took me to King's Cross. One out. Yeah. But the funny thing is, we're driving down the um, green lanes. I'm in the back of the car. There's three of them with me. And all I can hear behind is an engine roaring, bibbing, flashing lights. And I know it's my dad. In my heart, I know it's my dad. And then one of them went, Paul, is that your dad? I went, probably. And I looked over my shoulder and it was him. Because <laughs> he hated the police. Hated the police with a vengeance. And I said, just pull over, don't argue with him, and just hear him out. Just hear him out. And they heard him, he heard him out, and they went, look, we're telling him nothing's going to happen, and we ain't going to do that, don't we? And it was all right. But that gives you an insight into what I was brought up around where the police are concerned. What was it like for you to stab someone? Nothing. Enjoyment? Nothing. Sense of power? Just It was, um, that's it, it's done. Like today, picks they're stabbing people in the heart. Why are they stabbing people in the full-blown chest with big knives like that? When we was kids, you give them half the... You didn't even... You give them the top of the thing, bang, bang, and it's finished. You ain't there to kill them, are you? You're there to win the fight and not get hurt yourself. But today, these kids are... Yeah, it didn't mean nothing. In 2007 as well, you get jail for guns and drugs. No, what happened? What was the story with that? No, what happened? I was... I'd met someone the day before, no, on the day, and um, later on, this fella goes where he goes, I'll go where I'll go. I'm at home. He gets arrested. Anyway, I'll find out the next day. He's been nicked for unloading a lorry, uh, unloading a van with two bags. Then the van went to drive away. The van gets stopped. They find 17 kilo of heroin in the van. In the bags, it was 23 handguns, silencers, bullets, blah, blah, blah. So the fella gets nicked. Later on that night, the kid's dad gets nicked, who I met. He goes to trial. I'll get, let me stop. I go to a prison visit in called Grendon. You know Grendon? Yeah. I went to visit someone in Grendon Prison, the lifer. I come out, and as I walked out, I just sensed it and as the gate opened I looked and there was just about 15 of them soccer old Bill standing there I went oh Paul you've been arrested for so and so so and so so and so obviously I know what they're talking about because obviously I know that this fella's been nicked since then so this is a good six months afterwards I go up bow earing after bow earing not bow earing um, produce myself at the police station done me first when I've done the interview no comment no comment no comment that was it. No further action. Job finished. He goes up and gets knocked away. So that's how strong the evidence was on the man. Well, it was obviously a lot lighter on me, wasn't it? So that was it. End of subject. And then out of the blue, Emily, and don't forget, this is the thing I'll... Uh, I've been nicked twice on my own. Once with a gun in a car. And once coming out of a prison. Now, I'm nicked on my own. No one knows I'm nicked. So I have got carte blanche to be a rat. Because no one knows. It's not like I'm with someone and I've written a statement against them. I have, The next morning when I come out of the police station, I go straight round to everyone and go, listen, because I'm ashamed that I have got the word heroin written on my charge sheet. Not my charge sheet, my bow sheet. It's... That's a no-no. Where I come from, that you cannot entertain that shit. And it's a it's an unwritten rule that everyone's stuck by. That's why you didn't have no smack dealers in Island. They got jogged on. They would be terrified to sell that shit. So for me to be nicked for it was really shameful for me, even though I didn't know. Shameful. So, yeah, no further action. Yeah. What was your longest sentence? Oh, four years. Four years. What was that for? For the stabbings. Yeah. Is that what you got for the freeze mm. up the ass? So, your best friend, we'll get to this topic now, calling you a grass and he got nine years for shooting you. Right. What's the full story with this? Right. The bottom line is, he, he, he switched on me. I had to talk to him just before we fell out. Last conversation I've had. And I know, I know what it was about because... 
Pat had been out of crime or any involvement in anything for the best part of 30 years. That ain't no lie. The f I come out of prison in 2000 and he was a different person. He was chilled. He was relaxed. He, was, he weren't mixing with anyone who was at it. So when he would be in England, I wouldn't do nothing because I do not want to draw him into a conspiracy. Down to me. It ain't going to ever be down to me. So you ever get nicked, it won't be down to me. Association. Yeah. So I would make sure when he was here, I didn't do nothing. I'd never seen no one. When he went home, then maybe I'd duck and dive. But where was we going with that? Just about how you met and how it all began. And how oh, the yeah. feud began. So he says to me, Paul, he went, look, someone's doing something around me. Someone's doing up to no good. And I can feel it around me with the old bill and all that. So I said, well, let me assure you one thing. It ain't me. And he looked at me and went, it's not me. Well, if it ain't me, there's only one other person close to you. Right? So he should have answered the question himself. I weren't about to tell him. And that's, that's just me. I can't. I can't tell tales. My dad brought me up not to tell tales on people. And it's like, even this sitting here now, I don't feel right. Mm -hmm. I feel, I'm out of my comfort zone because I'm thinking to myself, hang on a minute, Paul, you're fucking talking on a, on a, yeah. on a, on a thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. So anyway, the, the, the argument, it was left. He won't see me. He won't come of, been clear the air, nothing. He's, he's avoiding me. But he's avoiding me because I think he knows he was wrong. And then as time went on, it got worse. Then I get called a smack dealer. Now he's dragging up something from, where was that? 10 years before. Oh, he was a smack dealer. I've never, I've never touched smack in my life. That, what are you talking bollocks for? You know that's not me. He knows it's not me. But now he's set his stall out, isn't he? And then the next thing is, I get told, he's calling me a police informer. He grabs some people up on a smack deal. What are you, what are you talking about, you prick? Because that's exactly how I thought. What are you talking about? You're acting like a fucking idiot. Because the people that I'm nicked with was found not guilty and have stood in my corner and gone, what are you talking about? What the fuck I do with him? You're mugging yourself off. But because of people around here pay lip service, He's getting away with it. Yeah. So did that fuel to the fire then? Yeah. That fueled it up. So my first move was, right, you won't face me. You won't hear me out. Right. So I'll get in touch with Pat Slizzer. So I want to organise a lie detector test. You know that I'm not 100%. I said, listen, I've got no other angle to go at. Get me a lie detector test done. Sorts out a lie detector. I'd go and do it. Bum, 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 bum. Didn't even... Didn't even I just went, I know what the answer's going to be. Come back. Or every one of them, no, 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 no. So I go down, I put it in a few places, put it in spills, couple of doors, different people got it, everyone got it. Then his son starts mouthing off, yeah, but he might have been on special pills that stops it working. And, and I thought, what have I got to do here? And people went, Paul, you ain't got to do that. Why are you why are you putting yourself through this? Yeah, why not just walk over here? I can't. Because as I just said to you, I've got nothing in this world. My name is 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 all I've got. And I'm not gonna allow you or anyone else to grasp me off. You ain't doing it. It's the, I've always swore, and I and I I've said this to his son, I've always swore, anyone ever called me a grass, I'm gonna kill him. I said, but the difference is, I love your dad. And I still can't even consider that. Because I did. Do you think it was the fact because it came from him, it was more heartbreaking for you? It was like my dad calling me it. Yeah. It was that painful that I've, I've given the man, I've put him before my wife and kids. My daughter said to me, Dad, you think more of his fucking son than you do of us. And I, this is when I come out of hospital. And I went... I did. I'm sorry, I did. But that's the life I was in. It was, 
I would, I would feel if something happened to his boy and I weren't now, I would be responsible in my head. No, still. Listen, let me just say this. People are going to go, you've got to be off your fucking head, but I don't care. If there's one person I would protect, if I could, would be him. And the reason why, because he's the only one who can give the truth. There's no one else on this planet can clear my name other than him telling the truth to his dad. That's all I... And that's all I've ever wanted. I wouldn't even want his dad to fall out of him or nothing. I just want him to be be a man, stand up, and just say, Dad, look, look it worked. Because you can imagine, if I'm going through this, you know he's going through it. Because that boy now is riddled with secrets and lies. And he knows what he's caused. He's caused indirectly his dad to go to prison with his lies. And his dad got a nine? His dad got a nine. What, what happened on the up run up to the shooting? It was, it, there was a... Many times did you get shot? Three times? One. 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 Threw it through here. Took me rib out. Threw me, uh, what's it called? Your bowel, my liver. And it come out here. Yeah, because I read it was three times, but it must have, a few yeah. different bits uh, just it was, went through. Or was it, that a dum-dum bullet? No, nah, 45. Fucking hell, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Never in my life have I felt something so painful. Did you think that he would have shot you? Listen, I, I, this, is, this is an odd one because I'll have to go back, resort to what Pat said in court. And Pat said in court, his defence was, I had a gun, right? I had a gun, I pulled the gun out, he ran across the pavement, dived in the car window, wrestled the gun off me, shot the gun, shot me with a gun and ran away. Sounds like Sounds like Jason Bond as well, doesn't it? Self-defence. Self-defence, right? But, You've done something you always said you would... It's against the rules. You don't stick on someone. I was quite happy to go to prison for seven years for the gun. Would have been... A, I would have still done it, even after all what had gone on, I would have done it. Did I ever think me and Pat would have got to that situation? Never. Because I thought he'd have been a man and admitted he was wrong and just sat back and gone, you know what? He fucking been a loyal friend to me. Loyaler than, listen, mate. He couldn't. He could never have a friend like me, never. And I don't think he actually realised. I think he just took it for granted. Were you willing to take the blame and actually do the sentence and say it was your gun? A million miles an hour. Was it put on you to take? No, it? no one even. No one. I done it. I tell you what happened. I come out of the hospital, and he probably don't even notice. I went straight to his slizzer. And I, and I sat down, I said, let me just tell you something. I said, there's no witnesses. He went, how do you know that? You can't know that. I said, trust me. I was the one laying on the floor with my eyes shut and my ears open. No witnesses see anything. And they didn't. I know they didn't. And it was like, so this is, I'm willing to hold my hands up and say I had the gun. I'll tell the truth. And he went, but it doesn't really help him. I said, really? Are you fucking mad? He's going to get a life sentence if he gets found guilty. Anyway, long story short, I've got the police driving me mad, right? They come round with Osmond letters, right? Your life's in danger over an unpaid debt. and I owe no one on this. I'm lying. I didn't owe anyone, in, anyone any money. Now I'm into about 100 grand's worth of debt. Right, which people have helped me out over the last eight years because I ain't functioned. I ain't lived, I ain't functioned. So people have stepped up, people that weren't really my friends. They're only become my friends because they don't like him. That's the truth of it. And they've come to me and they've gone, look me, I'll make that help you out and all that. Thank you. But um I've lost gone off track again, James. Yeah, no, you were talking about um, the oh, lawyers you were ready to quote court and take the blame so they, they come around with Osman letters non-stop I two three Osman letters and then I'll get a visit from them and you, you know what an Osman letter obviously yeah yeah, yeah yeah I said listen mate go away I'm not interested in your, in your what you can do and I'm in danger and all that if it comes it comes I'm, I'm up beyond that and then they rang up just before the trial and said listen Paul 
we're asking you again, will you give evidence? This is two days before the trial. And I said, right, I said, I'll tell you straightforward now. For me to give evidence for you, I'll be incriminating myself. And he went, what do you mean? I said, exactly what I'm saying. He went, so what you're saying is, I said, what I'm saying is what I've just said. I said, end of subject. So when they go to court, luckily, luckily, the, the COSA went and told the prosecutor what the conversation was, which I suppose in a way you've got to give that cop a bit of integrity there, haven't you? He's got a bit of integrity to tell the truth because he's really kiboshing his old trial by doing that. And he went and told the pros, and the pros had to admit it. They had to concede that either Mr. Tin and his lying, uh, Mr. Tin is telling the truth, which we can't refute it because there is no other witnesses, which means Mr. Adams must be telling the truth. They accepted it. Took the gun off of him. Did they get caught with the gun? No, but what they'd done, they dropped the charge of the gun mm -hmm. and just done him with um, excessive self defence. And he got a nine. And he got so a nine. For that, not only have you lost your best friend, You've been shot, and you, you still got the question mark about being a grass. So, how has life been in the last seven years since all that? It's no life. It's, it, I'll probably get slagged up for saying this, what I'm going to say now, but in hindsight, if I'd have known how this next seven years was going to pan out for me, and probably the next forever, I don't know, I hope not, but maybe it will. Maybe this will give me some peace. I would have rather died on that pavement. I would have rather died on that pavement. My wife and kids would have grieved for a year, two years, got on with their lives without me causing, just upsetting everyone. You imagine, I'm, I'm having this conversation every opportunity. If I don't have it with someone, I'll have it with myself, walking around the fields every day. So yeah, I would have rather have died on that pavement. Him and his old woman went to prison for 30 years, which I could have done nothing to stop. Mm -hmm. Everyone's happy. Everyone was fucking happy. What was it like being shot? It's like someone put in a hot poker, just slowly pushing it through you. And it was like, whoa. But I know what I've done. I can remember it, boom. I put it in the park, because I was in drive. I was just turning out. I put it in park, so I knew it was going to run into people. Got out. Try to run, but I couldn't. So I dropped on one knee. And I looked across the road, and he was staring at me like that. I think it was like, he, the look was, oh, fucking hell, what has happened here? This shouldn't have happened. And I just said to him, you're a wanker. That's the only thing I could think of saying. I said, you wanker. How's life been then? Have you, anybody ever came to you? Is your life in danger now? Or is, is nah, that listen. Some of the things I come out of people go, how can you think that? But I'm, I'm being straight. There's sometimes I want to walk out my door or get out of my car somewhere and get one in the head to give me some peace. My head is, it's like this fucking sack full of parrots and monkeys jumping around in my head all the time. I can't take it. It's, it's wearing me down. You seen anyone about that? I did, but it, it, it becomes to the point of you start to feel that you're, You've got to give them it. You've got to tell them the truth. Yeah, you've got to open up. Man. Yeah. You've got to surrender. But your dad will still be in your mind of course as, he is. man up, man up. But you need to and, and surrender to the pain. It was like, even, even I fell out with my dad. When they, what happened with them? When this text, I sent a text. <coughs> they was, he's meant to have insulted my wife and granddaughter behind my back, right? Someone come over my ass and told us what he'd been saying. And I thought, I can't have that. So I sent a text. It's kind of a meet in the park. If you read on the on the on the transcripts, it says it in it. Meet you over the park near Browning Laws. Long story short, text comes back. You're a grass. Your dad sells child pornography. So I thought, what is it with these people with this fucking word? Keep calling me a grass. So after the shooting goes on, and I'm out of hospital for about six months, maybe a bit longer, I sit down with my dad. And I said, right, I want to know, when you got nicked with him years ago, what was you nicked with? And he went, what do you mean? I got my sister around her and all to hear it. And he said, right, there was 50 books in the shop. 
This is 40 years ago. It weren't my dad's shop. It's a guy's name, Mickey Tepper's shop. He was running the shop. The books got delivered. Amongst the books, there was two child pornography books, which can range from the ages of 15, whatever. I don't know. I weren't there, so I don't know. And he said, oh, I've got Nick for the two child pornography books. I've got 12 months. So I went, Dad, you're shaming us. What are you doing? And he went, Paul, what do you expect me to do? What do I do? I either take the nick in or I grasp Mickey. Either way, I can't win. He said, but I'd rather go to prison than be a grass. And you know what? I had to, so I had to take me out of him for, because I know most people out there wouldn't have done that. But he hated the police. And it was, he couldn't surrender to the old Bill. But that got flung in my face. That made me a bad man. That's the sort of, that's the strength of the abuse. And that come mainly from his wife. That weren't really Pat's talking. That was his wife. When's Pat out? His own. Is it home? Been home six months. Would you try and make amends now? Or is it done? It's never going to be done with me for the simple reason. Listen, I forgive him completely. Completely forgive him for what happened. Because I challenged him. I called him on. I kept on and on looking for him and bump because I wanted to I wanted to clear the air. But there was this one bit no one was going to allow me to get next to Pat. The mum or the son. The son can't allow me because he knows the truth's going to come out. And the wife can't allow her son to be able to go out. So let's throw Paul under the bus. That's what happened. Did you never think about writing him a letter or anything? I wrote him a letter. No reply. I wrote him a letter in a prison, Pat. I never dreamed me and you would have ended up like this. Never you being in prison for nine years and me actually being the cause of it. That's how, that's how bad the, the narcissistic side turned me that even I thought it was my fault. How the fuck's it my fault? But I took that, I took it to blame. That's why I was willing to go and do a fucking seven for a gun. I would willingly. So you never stuck him in or anything for that day or anything, never went to court? No, no. And you're willing to take the blame? Of course I would. It's crazy, man. So where do you go from here, Paul? What's the, where do you go? You still try to get some closure on this to move on or you try to quiet down your demons? The demons are there forever because my wife don't understand. None of my friends who I see now understand. And I've been given some good, solid advice, right, from people. Paul... You ain't, he's the one who's lost out. He's lost a fucking friend he'd never find. He's only ever had two friends in his life and both of them have been called grasses. No evidence, no facts, just because that's what I want to call you. Well, I still can't... Look, if I tell you someone's been to my house and told me you've been insulting my wife and granddaughter, what are you going to do? Yeah, You're, you're going to want to know who told yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. No. I never said that, right? So this man's a liar, but this man is also a stirrer who's come and told me. So I, I don't get the, this is all about one thing, keeping him away from the truth. That's all this is about, keeping him away from the truth. Did you ever have addiction issues, Paul? Me? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. On what? Uh, started with cannabis, blues, speed, coke, crack, um, full blown, full blown Ironed out every dollar I had. When was this? 2000 and, 2002, I suppose, I started. I've doing it since I was 14. But the crack, that's when the problem started. That's when it got too much for me. How and long I, were you on that for? Four years, five years. Every day, a quarter a day. <sighs> every day. A quarter a day, man, that's four years. You're talking millions. Oh, don't. You know That's why all my kids are living with me because I've got nowhere else to live. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't want all my money. All my money. And what money I did have. They, uh, look, this is, this is, the, uh, this is what eats me, right? I get called a smackhead, a, a smack dealer, a thief, because I also rob people, a grass. My wife and granddaughter get insulted behind my back. And on top of it, I'm, I'm in a fucking hospital in a coma. And the first thing he thinks of doing is we take his money and all. That's fucking, that's shabby. Mm -hmm. 
Not on anyone's word, on a lie he's been told. Another lie. Another lie. Even, it, it's, none of it matters. None of it fucking matters. I would, I would give anything for a half hour conversation with him. Just to go, right, bang, 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 bang. There's your answers. Yes, I'm wrong for not telling you. I couldn't have told tales. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have. Do you not think the man it's time to maybe just walk away and just try and live your life? Is. Of course it is. And put some closure on it yourself. But everyone I talk to, uh, whoever they are. Because look what you've already lost. Look what I've lost everything. Look what already happened. Do you know what I mean? So your loyalty, and it's scary to think that you're still trying to be loyal and still trying to get some closure. Because that's, like you say, all you've got is your word. And, but look where it's got you. Hey, listen. It has got me there. Because mm -hmm. if I'd have been a man, a prop, if I'd have been a friend on the... Listen, when he's he's not involved in nothing no more, and I am, there's not a lot I can do about that. So I've got to, I've got to eat. I've got to live still. I've done all my money on fucking drugs. He don't know that. It's not, he's not, not his concern. So for me to... I should have gone to him and said, listen, I've got something to tell you. And flung this person under the bus like he flanged me, right? I still felt I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. It's not in my makeup. It's really not in my makeup. Do you drink or anything now? No, nah, I ain't drunk or touched drugs for 10 years now. Congratulations. Yeah, 10 years. And you think, <clears throat> have you ever wrote a book or anything, Paul? I've been offered an opportunity to do two books. Um, one of them, I wanted to. It was my life story, but they was really more in concerned about about them. That's what they wanted to know about. Well, that weren't about what I wanted to do. And um, bottom line is, I said, they said, what sort of money? I said, I don't want no money. If I write a book, it's for nothing. It's because I need to get it out of me. And, and this is it, two books, newspaper articles, television interviews, which people was trying to get earlier doors. I rejected everything. Because it ain't about money with me. It's Stephen now, his loyalty mm. is, keeping my word and loyalty is all I've got. Why are you telling your story now? Because I thought this might help me exercise a few of the demons. Therapy? Yeah. Speaking about it. Are you hoping maybe Pat sees this as well and Course. maybe reaches out that? Of course. He won't because he's, 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 look, I put the word in straight up. He's a fucking narcissist. He, he don't admit he's wrong. He don't ever apologise to no one. Because he's Pat, he can do what he wants, say what he wants. Because no, he never gets pulled to task. And nobody's ever tried to put any hits out in your life since the first shooting? Nah. 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 I've got no enemies out there. My only enemies are his enemies. That's the only enemies I've ever had. Mm -hmm. I, I don't blow my own trumpet. It's just something I don't, I ain't got that, that, that sort of way of doing it. I'm a fucking good man. I've been a loyal man and I've been a good man. I've always stuck to the rules. I've always done things right to the best of my ability. Whether they're right and other people go, why don't you do it this? No, because I'm not giving that ammunition out. People love ammo on you. You're not having ammo on me. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. So for the future then, you're thinking about maybe doing a couple of books, still working on the mind, try to quiet it down a bit, stopping the monkeys and the gorillas jumping about, just banging heads. I've got to get therapy. Yeah. I've got to get some help because... As I said, I've I've been I've been to some uh, bad low places. I've been to some terrible places in my mind where I look around and I think everyone I see they just must think oh here he comes again, and I, I'm I'm telling the same because it's it's fresh in my mind. Yeah, the brain only repeats what it knows though. Yeah, there's nothing else going on in my life. I've not earned no money in eight years. Do you nothing. think you're too proud to go and ask for help? Are you scared to open up completely and get everything out that? Because let's face it, see when you start making changes, your conscience grows tenfold. You start thinking about the misery and pain you've caused. Exactly. And that shit is tough. But you need to push through that to create change. And like I says earlier, the brain only repeats what it knows. So the 60,000 thoughts you get a day just now, you're taking into the next day, the next day, unless you start doing something different. Exactly. Whether that's opening up, speaking the truth and putting your cards on the table. Obviously, you need to be careful what you're saying here. But I think you've had a good credit to yourself to put things from your own mouth because the papers and shit, they can twist words, they yeah, can they blow do twist things it. out of proportion. Um, 
But yeah, man, it's all down to the individual how much you want to change. And as long as you've got air in your lungs, you've still got something to give life. No matter how fucked up your past is, no matter what you've done, people can make changes to better their life and actually quieten this down. It's difficult because you've had, what, 60 odd years of trauma, mm. pain, misery, heartache. You don't know how to fucking deal with that. You dealt with all that through violence. Exactly. Violence and people pleasing. Mm -hmm. That's how I got my gratification. Yeah. Do him, never saying the word no. Were you well liked in London? I like to think so. Yeah. I've, I, I don't hear many people run me down. The only people that run me down are people that, that I talk to him because they're scared to say, well, mate, I'm being funny. I don't book him in the grass and I think he's a fucking good man because he saved you a fucking life sentence, that's for sure. What do you think for anybody watching that's maybe going through our struggle, Paul, of a life of crime who would maybe think it's good to go down that route, the violence, the anger, yeah, the frustration? Listen, it's, it's, it seems like a good idea. I had this when I went to the school. I used to go in schools when I come out of the hospital, talking to young kids, trying to get them out of the gangs and all that. And it ain't what it's... It's really just like it says in the films and in the books. That all that loyalty and you'll be looked after and you're this and that. And that. No, no, you're only as good as your last favour. That is you. You're just used, you're cannon fodder, you're there to be used and abused. And the sooner you see it, the better. Because you'll be in situations, people, that you could be put in a situation where you might have to do something to your best friend. Now, live with that. And that's the sort of situations people get in. Yeah. It's a crazy, it's the most false existence. I've wasted all my life on these principles and morals that 60 years down the road, fuck me. Look at me, I'm a broken man. Yeah, I've had a lot of criminals on and people who's had some very colourful pasts and I see the vulnerability, I see it. And no matter, I believe no matter what you do in life, the, every, the brain stores everything. So yeah. if you do some painful shit to other people, in your mind that stores it. So a lot of people have either went down the suicidal route or addiction problems because in here we're ashamed, we're embarrassed to the misery and the, Guilt. the destruction. Yeah, yeah, of what we've caused. And no matter how tough you are that's still in here and it I've is. seen the toughest men become the weakest and the weakest become the toughest but you can make the changes and the sacrifices and if you're speaking through schools to show other kids not to go down that path maybe that's the route you should be really looking down I tried to push it further but I think I was a bit too old for them and they was mainly black kids in Tottenham and they're looking at me as much say it was the old man though and I know what they're thinking but they did listen to me primary school kids at their last year, which is where you've got to catch them. Mm -hmm. Don't catch them when they get to secondary school because it's done. They're in the mix now. Yeah, they've already made their mind up. Yeah, but as I said, regrets and all that. Yeah, when I woke up in that hospital, I was in a coma for five weeks. And I remember just waking up, got a tracky thing coming out of my throat. I don't know what's going on. Is that why you do that? I don't know, Dom, I'll keep doing it. Well, yeah, have done yeah. it a few times. But it was, it, it, yeah, it was a constant thing. And, um, yeah, and I looked round me and I, there's two geezers with machine guns. And I went, and my wife went, Paul, they've been here because I want to know what they're doing at the end of my bed. And I can barely talk. They had to put a thing over the top to talk. And I remember looking at them and thinking, what the fuck? And he went to me, Paul, we're here to help you, right? What can you remember? Oh, we've been here for three weeks. And as soon as you woke up, they asked that? Yeah, and I went, let me just tell you something. You've been here for three weeks, four weeks. Your job's done. You can go home now. They went, but I said, thanks for looking after my family. They didn't need looking after. I said, but I appreciate it anyway. And they walked out. I had them coming into me and offering me deals, right, to throw him under a bus. I mean, a brand new life. Go here, you can have this, you can have... They come to me and offer me things that are like, really? Are you that desperate? And I'm, I know he's not been involved in crime for 30 years. I know he ain't. That's fact. And they're still that desperate to defending him again, aren't I? Yeah. But that's because of the <laughs> back end. It's, uh, I'm doing it again. But it's obviously, you know where your lawyer is lying. He's, uh, maybe he's hurting as well just as much as yourself, is. but I again, you is. don't know. You've got to, for people who, who weren't in that life and look outside from that name, the na it's a big name everywhere. So 
it's difficult, obviously, even for you to speak about it. It'll still bring back a lot of emotions. When you were in hospital after being shot, did you have many visitors? Yeah, a few people. Did not you? as well. Anyone who came up there, it was um, that to get their name and all that at first. Yeah. But that was hard to first. And then after I'd come out of coma, my wife wouldn't let no one into me. See me. A couple of good friends who was there, and they've been good friends still now. Yeah, that's a good thing. And because, I'll, always, yeah, I'll always love them. Because you know, you know I mean? yourself, if you're in prison or if something, the, the shit hits the fan, nobody's there to be seen. You know that. Nobody is there to be seen. And that's the scary thing. And that's what people need to understand. A life of crime is a life of misery. He it's was telling same. people, and he, his boy was telling people, no one's allowed to visit him. No one's allowed to visit him. Who makes you the fucking sheriffs? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But do you feel good? Do you feel safe enough that your life is not in danger or anything nine years later now that he's out I don't care I know it, you, you might yeah. think you can't well, because I know I, I genuinely don't care for me yeah. these days I get out of bed and death will be a release death will be I've said it to my wife the only time I'll ever be at peace is when I'm dead because that brain will go bang and it's off I don't want to but I can't carry on like this for another 10 years for me personally I would seek help. I would speak to someone and get and and lay your cards on the table. Someone who, whether it's a private conversation, it's trust and it's a sense of release, a sense of therapy. To you're at that stage now where you, you're at the crossroads, and if mm. you're thinking I would rather be fucking dead just to stop those thoughts, but you're still here, so you're clearly here for a reason. Well, that's that's what I've, I've been for a lot of ill, lot of since this. I've had seven lots of surgery, down to the shooting, and it ain't it never stopped for the first three years, but. I got myself fit, got myself healthy again. And I mean, I got super fit again. And then, bang, I get blood clots on the lungs and now it's took me backwards again. I've put weight on and I can't train there. Yeah. It's just like a vicious circle. Yeah, it's just a bit of depression and that as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But you know yourself, if you're feeling good, it gives you that wee bit of self-confidence. Plus, you've got the serotonin, endorphins, dopamine, the stuff that fights depression, anxiety, mm. fear. The exercise is key mm. for our methods are thinking the madness the craziness the the fucking darkness the pain the exercise is key it's can you amazing. exercise then with blood in the lungs has it all been drained well, they're all clotted so yeah. it's it's the excess strain on the art isn't it we were getting tablets they the say wolfing. aspirin and shit wolfing so no blood as well blood thinners yeah but you can't exercise then not really because you can't get your heart rate up you don't you're not just meant in to. case it clots well the, the pills will stop it clotting anymore what about meditation I've had a go at that when I was like in the rehabs and all that. So I've done all the rehabs mm-hmm. and um, I can't seem to get it right. I can't seem. I was looking up the other day. I thought, what am I going to do? I'm going to go and find a monastery, right, in the middle of India and just live in a monastery for a couple of months and find myself. Six weeks, two months. Yeah, they do places do that. They, they, they do ones where it's a silence place where you don't say anything, just sit there, meditate because it's all about quieting the mind down. Exactly. And your mind ain't going to change unless you, you choose something totally different totally different to put yourself out of the comfort zone yeah man. because we all I believe we all want to make changes we all want a better mindset but it is difficult we live in a very fast world and especially the demons and the pain that you've seen it's just on repeat it's just like somebody's just pressing fucking repeat here you go so again is. here you go again here you go again but quieting the mind meditation breathing techniques I jump up mountains man I'm jumping I do cold water exposure in the cold water I need to push myself to the extremes because mm. if I don't I slip into depression and I slip into it fast and yeah. then it's overeating and yeah. then I'm scared that I open the door because if I start having a drink or having a line or placing no. one bet they all fucking come through the door all and once. within two weeks I've fucked everything so it's very slippery slope but like I said earlier you're here for a reason and hopefully you can get things sorted hopefully you can get some closure maybe make amends I don't know but for you to come on today and tell your story mate it takes balls as well to yeah, I'm, speak I'm, about I'm, it I'm glad I've done it I'm um it's, it's got out of me what was... Eating your life? Yeah. Oh, right, obviously, some's held back, which is only for his ears. Yeah, of course. But he don't want to hear it. He don't want to hear it, does he? Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, Paul? No. No, just the last the last thing I'd, I'd say, and this is the other side of that life, of that morals and the principles and the law in sticking to the rules and the code. I laid on that floor, and this thing comes back on time, I laid on that floor with my eyes shut, thinking, right, all I could hear was, what's your name? What's your name? I thought, no, I'm going to 
fucked all like a man. I'm not even going to tell him my name. What the fuck was that about? And I ended up getting the passport out of the car and, and going over my wife. And that's all I was thinking about. You make sure you die like a man here. Is that your dad talking? Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. You don't tell the police nothing. Yeah, no comment, no comment. No, no name, comment. nothing. And I thought, well, after it all comes back, you think to yourself, how mad was that? I did say one thing to one woman. I said, tell my family I love them. That's all I said to this woman who's walking by. Did you think you were dying? Yeah, I was. Abd I, I knew I was going. I knew I was going. Did you die? No. Nah. The last thing I remember was in the, in the scan, and I looked up and I see a red cross, which is like a CT scan thing. Yeah. And he went to me, hold on, just hold on, stay awake, and I went on going. And that's the last thing I remember saying. <sighs> fucking scary, man. And them fucking dreams. Them dreams you have. Oh, mate. <laughs> They're horrendous <laughs> afterwards. Were you on the boffin? Yeah. 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 That would have took away the pain. But it was, um, yeah, but I said to you, waking up that day and looking around me and seeing people's faces, and I'd lost about five stun over that month in the intensive care. And I looked around me and I thought, now you know how other people feel. How many people have you put in this situation? For what? And it gave me this, this, I don't know. Do you think karma comes into play with yeah, that, Paul? Yeah, yeah. You was owed this. Yeah. I was owed this. Karma's a powerful thing. I was owed it. Yeah. And that's one thing, I've got to say this about Pat, he used to always say this, whenever I say anything about anyone, it always comes back and bites me in the ass, And it does. And... He wants to hope that calling people grasses don't come back and bite him on the ass. Yeah, it's crazy, man. But for coming on today, mate, and telling your story, Paul, Thanks, I, re mate. I really appreciate it. Appreciate I, it. I wish you all the best for Really the appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. God bless. Thanks, Thank mate. You.